Greg Deal is a provocative contemporary artist who challenges Western perceptions of indigenous people, touching on issues of race, history, and stereotypes. Through his work, paintings, mural work, performance art, filmmaking, and spoken word, Deal critically examines issues and tells stories of decolonization and appropriation that affect Indian country. Deal's activism exists in his art as well as his participation in political movements. He has been heavily involved with the media activist movement, hashtag change the name. Posting a video, a video to Vimeo inviting indigenous people's commentary on the sports mascot, mascot issue in response to mainstream media's attempt to an erasure, attempt erasure of indigenous voices. He is currently showing along with 15 other contemporary artists of indigenous descent throughout North America at the Fruitlands Museum of Harvard in Harvard, Massachusetts. Recently, a photograph of Deal was included in the December 2018 National Geographic Society magazine article, Native Americans are recasting views of indigenous life. Deal was a native arts artist in residence in the Denver Art Museum in 2015 through 2016 an artist residency at UC Berkeley in 2017 through 2018. His work has been exhibited nationally since 20, 2002. Deal has lectured widely at prominent educational institutions and museums, including Denver Art Museum, Dartmouth College, Columbia University, and the Smith Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. His television appearances include PBS The Art District, The Daily Show, and totally biased with Kam Kamal Bell. Please go to uh, gregdeal.com for more information, and that's Greg with the double G. So now I'd like to introduce Greg Deal. Hi. Um, I'm very appreciative to be here. And uh, we're halfway through, right? We're like officially halfway through today. And uh, I think we've had a chance to get to know each other. So uh, for those of you that are in person, I apologize in advance. You may be hearing some repeat things because I tend to talk a lot. Um, and we will start with this guy. <laughs> Big hair and bolo ties. Um, I grew up in a small town in Utah called Park City. Um, it acts like a big town, but it's really a small town. Um, and, and I want to show you guys this because, um, and you've, you've probably heard me talk about it, but uh, my family is important to me. Um, but it's important to me in terms of like having a center, having a place that I can, um, that I can go, a safe place in, in my life that I can be. And um, my wife and my family are those things. And uh, that was this summer. And I mean, as, as silly as that is, and maybe it's not silly at all, but uh, these, these are my people. And um, as an indigenous person, and you'll see my indigeneity through my work, um, but family and friends and your connections are the most important. And so that's, that's who this is. Um, I think, yeah, starting uh, on my right, to the left, uh, that's Maddox, Grayson in the green shirt, Phoenix, uh, he's my 12 year old oldest boy there in the middle. Sage is, uh, this is several years ago, so Sage is in purple and Holland was just a little girl in this one. And these are my people. There's an aspect of fatherhood and there's an aspect of humor that exists in our house that is incredibly important. A lot of people don't realize that native people are funny and, uh, and, and I think a lot of that it has to do with stereotype of stoicism and, and, and things of that nature. Um, but like any group that has suffered significant trauma, you find ways to cope and humor is absolutely one of those ways to do that. That's Grayson's face mask. <laughs> there, and there's an element of irreverency too. So um, she doesn't know what she's doing, but it's still funny. <laughs> Uh, Halloween's coming up, so this is Phoenix several years ago where I talked him into shaving his head uh, so that he could be a middle-aged white federal worker. Um, 
when we were living in Washington, D.C. Um, and this is the last bit I want to show you guys. Um, so this is Grayson when he was little, and my wife has been documenting him doing what she calls um, sideways pose. It's just sort of a lean with swagger. It's, it's funny and it's cute and everything, except that he's been doing it his whole freaking life. <laughs> Like if it's, even ever since he was a baby. So. I wanted to share this because this is sort of a good starting point. Uh, this really is, um, I think, who I am, and I think it's an important aspect of who I am. Um, so you'll hear me talking about these guys, but uh, this, is, this is them, and, and they are um, the most important people in my life. Um, so I just want to show you some work. I'm going to talk through the work. Oh, and a little bit of humor there for you. Um, hey, girl, how about some bear skin on my bear skin? But uh, there is an aspect of the work that I believe is sort of, it's, it's life in action, right? The, the work reflects life. It reflects the way that uh, we see ourselves or the way that we see the world whether it's a juxtaposition between an actual native person and a caricature of a native person. Sometimes it's the drama. Sometimes it's reappropriating old images that exist in what is clearly a contemporary space, thus redefining the image. Um, something that is incredibly difficult for native people because we are so much beholden to the um, perception of our existence. I am a painter, well, that's what I went to school for. So uh, painting was a big part of it. Uh, and as an artist who's doing it in practice for work, um, I've been able to expand those things. But at the end of the day, this is sort of where a lot of my heart is, a lot of where my practice is, a lot of where things begin. Now, some of you guys might know this, uh, and I think it may have been mentioned here and there. Um, I call myself a disruptor um, because I feel like that it's my job, or like I have to disrupt spaces that I'm in. Um, I like it better than the word activist, which is like a whole other thing, which of course is being commodified at this point. Um, I think there's a game show now uh, that is about activism, which sounds really sick and twisted to me. Um, and I also believe that what one person calls an activist, a mother, another might call an adult with an opinion. Um, that really is only the difference between who has the microphone and who doesn't, uh, if there's a microphone at all. Um, and so disrupting spaces and disrupting things that already exist end up being an important part of the work. Um, this is called the indigenous flag. Um, I actually have four of them. I believe they're in here. Um, maybe they're following. No. Um, and it was born under the concept of flags like the Black Lives Matter flag and um, other flags that are associated with the American flag to denote um, some aspect of political or social uh, tie-in. And so I created this under the understanding of like what does, what would this flag look like if it was wholly informed by indigenous people. And so I've incorporated basket patterns and things that um, exist within my own community to sort of be repetitive uh, within making something that is familiar, which is kind of like the American flag. Um, and in part of the disruptive sort of process of creating work that challenges me as well as other people around me are, are simple things. Um, this is a self-portrait of me when I was six years old. And uh, the title of this piece is uh, Prairie N-Word. Um, I actually have a plaque there at the bottom, a brass plaque that has the name uh, uncensored, engraved onto the piece. Um, this is the very first racial slur that I ever heard pointed in my direction. And uh, that's how old I was when I heard it. And so I wanted to create something that was seemingly innocuous, but that would um, 
push some buttons, push some boundaries. Uh, placing the plaque on there was a deliberate action uh, because I knew that it would be censored. I knew that a curator would get it and that they would try to censor the word uh, instead of allowing it to beget a conversation, a, a very important conversation, not just about racism, but also about the intersectionality of that racism and, uh, and what happens when you're perceived as being different or other. Uh, and in this case, uh, brown was, was my, my cardinal sin. Um, this is a piece called uh, Bloody Elbows and Bloody Knees. Uh, this is a boarding school piece. Um, I made it after hearing a story uh, from an elder that talked about being in the boarding school that my grandparents went to, um, Stewart Indian School, which is in Nevada, and um, hearing about this kid that was brought into the boarding school. And, um, and what they do is they bathe them. They believe the natives are dirty, so they bathe them. They put like a, they put like a talc on them, like for lice, and, um, and scrub them down. And when the woman who was caring for this child uh, was finished, she noticed that his knees and his elbows were darker than the rest of them. It looked dirty. Uh, and anyone who has a little melanin in their skin knows that like, those are the areas that bunch up and uh, they're a little bit darker than the rest of us. Um, not knowing that, she took a wire brush and she scrubbed his elbows and she scrubbed his knees um, until he was bleeding and then put him in a garment uh, and set him to, to bed with the rest of the children. Um, he cried because he was in pain and uh, also soiling his sheets with his own blood. And so as he's making noise, an adult comes in, turns on the lights, sees that he's soiled his sheets and um, took him in the other room and proceeded to beat him for the next hour. Uh, they killed him. Nobody ever heard from him again. I, I created this piece specifically because of this idea that indigenous representation and uh, indigenous stories can only exist in areas where the stories are familiar to the viewer, to non-native people. And ultimately meaning that this work somehow doesn't have value if it's not, um, if it's not uh, familiar. And in an effort to sort of take risks and also tell stories that do matter, um, created a piece that was meant to be all of those things while also challenging the perceptions that, uh, that are there. Um, the, this painting's interesting because I was in a show in uh, Colorado, like the, probably the second biggest um, uh, museum there is called History Colorado. And we did a whole exhibit and I brought this piece and I've never shown it and I brought it to them to hang. Um, and I didn't find out until like near the opening. They're like, oh, we, we're not hanging it because um, it's, it's got nudity in it. And, uh, and it's interesting because that show is now traveling throughout Colorado and the first place it hit um, where it's at right now is a Ute Museum in Southern Colorado and they hung that up unapologetically. And it's interesting, the perception on those things. I mean, I think the justification was nudity, but there's some other aspects associated with it that make it, um, I think, hard for people to swallow. But I mean, isn't that what art's supposed to do? Isn't that, uh, isn't that how it's supposed to challenge? Um, my work is uh, graphical. Um, the graphics of my work can also exist as murals. Um, same case here. Says your luxury is our displacement. Uh, it cuts off on mine, but it doesn't cut off there. And um, yeah, so murals are one of the mediums I do. Um, I could just say I paint. Uh, I did this literally the week before I came here, and uh, they were like, "Can you do this?" I said, "Sure." <laughs> and, uh, two solid days. Um, I'm currently working on a body of work right now called The Others, uh, where I've reappropriated old comic book images from the 40s and 50s of, of native people um, and recontextualized them uh, in this form, where all of the figures are either standing strong or they're winning, the natives are winning. Um, and I've replaced the dialogue with lyrics from, um, from old punk songs. This one's a, a Clash song. 
Um, this one's a very dark misfit song. Uh, I've got something to say. I killed your baby today. It doesn't matter much to me as long as it's dead, says the colonialist. And the native person says, sweet, lovely death. I'm waiting for your breath. Come sweet death. One last caress as though that chokehold is a, a caress of some kind. Um, I actually found an illustration of a native person punching a priest, so that's in there. <laughs> uh, this is a Sex Pistols, I'm an antichrist, I'm an anarchist, I don't know what I want, but I know how to get it. This reminded me of uh, masks. <laughs> give me convenience or give me death. So this is an interesting set of works because it's uh they're simple they're easy to create uh well relatively easy to create they people see them they understand them they know what it means um but there's another aspect of it just to how i grew up the music i used to listen to and uh and just how that articulated my own uh sense of of being and, and purpose um, i've been able to do this in other forums so it's actually just on a punk vest um, there's actually a mural of it as well <laughs> Uh, it's a descendant song. We flipped our finger to the king of England. We stole our country from the Indians with God on our side and guns in our hands. We took it for our own. A nation dedicated to liberty, justice, and equality. And the native is saying, does it look that way to you? It doesn't look that way to me. The sickest joke I know. Um, and those lyrics are not even out of context. That's exactly the, the order in which those lyrics exist. Um, which is interesting, you know, as a young, young native person seeing this music, it speaks to my own experience and to my own ideas and to be able to come back, you know, 46 years later and, and um, incorporate that into my work in a way that makes sense to me while also creating something that makes sense to other people in it, perhaps a different way, um, is really exciting. Um, I just found this, <laughs> this is an old conceptual piece, it's called Vehicular Dreamcatch. Um, and it's a commentary on the appropriation of things like dream catchers that are hanging from people's rear view mirrors. Uh, who are all these white people sleeping in their cars while they're driving? Like that's just totally unsafe. Um, but yeah, just a comment about, about that. Um, here's the flag series I mentioned. Uh, that's the indigenous flag number one, indigenous flag number two, indigenous flag number three, and indigenous flag number four and was able to print these uh, and do a nice installation. This is in Kansas City this year, and it uh, looks super cool. It's like a nice way of laying it out, and you can walk around it, and you can see it, and sort of take it in. And so my work is going into this place of thinking in broader terms of um, uh, presentation. Um, the part I really want to get to is uh, my performance work. Um, this is work that is very exciting to me. Um, this is my first performance piece. It was called The Last American Indian on Earth. Um, this is uh, not a contrived image. Uh, this happened. This family came up. They wanted to take a picture. This guy wanted to point at his Cleveland Indians hat sitting next to me at the sculpture garden at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., uh, sitting on the fountain. And uh, my wife is actually one who took this photograph, uh, kind of got a great vantage point for it. But it's this idea of it sort of existing in plain sight while also uh, simultaneously carrying a stereotype. So my entire outfit from top to bottom is contrived. Um, the headdress, I believe, is made in Mexico. The beads on the headdress are made in China. Um, everything is just like coming out of a kit or is just like just a caricature of itself, um, which of course changes the caricature. But I also found it to be an incredible space not only to challenge the different spaces that I'm in and the people who perceived me, um, but to also push buttons as well. Um, after that, I did this piece called Red Skin. And uh, it was about the vernacular that exists online. So like you could go to an article about the uh, mascot debate and you could skip the article and just go straight to the comment section. And so there's four antagonists here. And I taught them, uh, or I told them to read the comment section, like pick up that vernacular and that's how you're gonna communicate with me. And we did this for about six hours. It got mildly out of hand too. It was kind of an interesting uh, experiment. 
Um, but on the other end, uh, this is a piece that I created. Um, it's called, uh, oh my gosh, I just blanked. Um, <laughs> it's, it's based on the premise of um, the Washington football team fans having a ceremony. Uh, so this is like the uh, ceremony of the Washington Redskins team, because uh, this idea of like, you can't take this away, like it's sacred. So I've objectified a white man in Redskins gear who's watching the football game in a gallery. And, uh, and it was just to poke fun, but also like it's a, it's a performance piece. This is a friend of mine that you'll notice there in the back. <laughs> and um, he was always good for it. Um, when I moved to Colorado and I got my residency at the Denver Art Museum, um, they said I could do anything, uh, and I did. And I did this, uh, at, on my exit, I did this performance piece, it's called Indian Pedigree. And it's about blood quantum, and it's about the fact that the only things in the United States that are quantified by blood quantum are dogs and horses and Indians. And uh, had the uh, pedigree, if you will, um, all of the breakdown of the different fractions of my bloodline um, tattooed on my arm live as I did a spoken word piece. Um, wasn't very easy, uh, anyone who has a tattoo, that's not an easy ask. Um, but we had this incredibly emotional sort of setup of doing this work while, and, and everything's on purpose. So the, the woman standing in the back of the podium is actually my sister. Um, she is the announcer in this, so she would announce my name. She would read off all the different aspects of uh, that bloodline. There was a native standing on each side of me who brought me to this chair and then stood sentry over me. Um, and even the tattooist is a white guy. He's facilitating the mark. Um, and that's how the, the narrator sort of uh, referred to it as the mark. Commence with the mark, she would say. Um, I have videos of this stuff if you guys are interested. Uh, most of them should be on my website, but um, some of them are hard. But the magic of performance art and the magic of being able to interact with other uh, artists has begotten some amazing things. Um, I did a show at the Smithsonian. It was called uh, Cross Lines, a culture lab on intersectionality. There was about 40 other artists that were all participating from all around the world. And um, two artists uh, had somehow landed on the radar of the Smithsonian, and um, the Smithsonian restricted their work, and I was one of them, and the other one is uh, this performance artist. Her name is Anita Ali, uh, who's a Cambodian Muslim. And uh, I had set up a teepee and uh, filled it with art. Um, the original concept was to actually fill it with Ikea furniture, but there was a lot of censorship and things going on. Um, her concept was, uh, and this is in 2016, so it's very, very uh, relevant. Um, can a Muslim American be a patriot? And so she's on a stage. The building's like an apex or uh, like a cross. And so at the apex, there's a fountain, and they built a stage, and she had these American flags. And she's standing on that space, but we had decided because we were having this shared experience that we would intersect as the title uh, sort of dictated. Um, and we stood together on her stage. And I don't think I realized it until the exact moment that it happened, how sort of incredible this moment was. That uh, a, a Muslim woman who um, was being contractually obligated to not speak during her performance uh, for the Smithsonian in 2016, when Trump was, uh, laying out all of the sort of anti-Muslim rhetoric. Uh, a native person surrounded by flags that have embodied this idea of uh, freedom, a concept that has not particularly been allotted to indigenous people uh, from, from its inception, you know, clearly until the present, uh, was just incredibly poignant to just stand in that space together. And um, it lasted six minutes uh, before I was forcibly removed from the stage. Um, I got in trouble, but um, that's okay. <laughs> the performance aspect of my work is actually really, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> it's, it's really hard. 
Um, but it also, you know, comes from this place of creating art for the sake of creating art and, uh, and realizing how powerful that is. Um, the uh, alumni, uh, James Luna, alumni to this, uh, to this residency, um, was my mentor and my friend, somebody that I had an opportunity to spend time with, somebody who taught me the power of performance art, because I took a performance art class in college and it was really dumb and I hated it so, so much. And it was just so hokey. And I mean, the most interesting thing was a girl that said, I like miming as a performance art. I'm like, you're a French clown that doesn't talk. Like I, none of these things appeal to me at all. And, uh, but James brought to my life the vibrancy of this work, the statements that you can make, the ways in which you can make those statements um, on a dime, you can change your narratives and you can continue to do the things you need to do. And, and also the unexpected nature of it. I mean, the last American Indian on earth, that wasn't in a gallery, it was out in open space, it was in the wild. Anything can happen and virtually anything did. Um, but it also is just an incredible piece to use your body to, uh, to make a point, to illustrate, to paint, to sculpt, to do all those things. I and mean, James, you, whenever you ask James what kind of artist he was, he would always say he was a painter. Um, he was known as a performance artist, but uh, perhaps in the perception of art and in creation, maybe he is a painter and maybe he is a sculptor. And so I look at this very much the same way. Uh, this was a piece I made uh, during the Standing Rock uh, altercation. And uh, I am simply reading the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1851, uh, which is essentially saying that no decisions can be made within the bounds of these lands without permission from uh, the tribes who had a vested interest in that space. So building a pipeline in that area sort of at its basis was incredibly problematic from a treaty standpoint, which is protected under the Constitution, Article 6, Section 2, uh, which states that treaties are the supreme law of the land. And so I'm simply reading that, this is called the supreme law of the land. Um, while two men in white, uh, white men in suits are antagonizing me um, with oil. If you look at the cup on the table there, um, they put it in the cup as well. And uh, so you go to drink it and everybody gasps and it's, it's a whole thing. Um, but it was meant to really sort of illustrate or at least articulate that doing something as simple as reading something that is truth, that is law, that is ups, upheld by something as important as the Constitution um, can be antagonized with all these other things. And it was a mess. Um, I was also in this piece, uh, one of my favorite parts is I got, a, um, I got an American flag and I had a, a man, a white man dressed in white and I'm standing on the American flag and he comes in and he's cutting pieces off the flag and just flinging them off to the side until he cuts it till all that's left is just what I'm standing on. And um, there's some conservative folks in my community where I live that were very, very upset with me about that. Um, but it was a throw from Bed Bath & Beyond, so I didn't think it was like really desecrating anything. Uh, and, uh, but it was a metaphor for land that it was just cut away and cut away and cut away to all that was left is what you're standing on. Um, which was one of my favorite parts of this. Performance to me is about taking up space and it is about presence and creating presence, whether that's in what you're wearing, uh, with your own person, uh, with your hair, with your voice, with the sounds that you make. Um, this is called Invisible Loss Movement, and uh, this is a piece I did with my oldest. She was, uh, I believe, 13 at the time, um, where we would dance. You know, we're wearing these um, traditional powwow outfits. I'm wearing a men's northern traditional outfit, and she's wearing uh, a jingle dress. And I eliminated two things. I eliminated the color from these, because powwow outfits are very colorful, so when you're dancing and you're moving, there's colors happening at the same time. So I removed the color and I removed the music. Um, we're actually wearing wireless headphones. So we're in sync, we're dancing, we can stay in rhythm, uh, but the viewer can't hear anything except the bells that are on my ankles and the cones that are on her dress. You can kind of see flailing out. Um, and 
she danced and then I danced and then we danced together. And there's a beat in, in the songs it's called an honor beat. And uh, so the beat would just do this and then all of a sudden the honor beat would go and then it would get back on beat. Well, during that honor beat, that's when you raise your hand and that's what Sage is doing. So we would frequently be dancing and then we would just suddenly raise our hands at the same time. And um, people, it was interesting because people would treat it like it was a sacred ceremony and that's not what it was. It's a performance piece. It's informed by my perception of my own indigeneity and things that exist within you know, my orbit as a native person. And looking at it as a viable performance piece and powwows, they give you so much information. There's usually an MC that's telling you what kind of dance this is, who the, who the drum is, who the dancers are, how they're dressed, why they have this, why they have that. They inform everything. Um, then there's the sound of the drum. And if you've ever been to a powwow, they're just so loud and just like you can feel it in your chest. And, uh, and the singing is just, it just amplifies so much. Um, but you're informed by everything that's happening, even like a couple little ladies in the row in front of you complaining about how bad the fry bread is, like you're just informed by everything. And I wanted to take all that out. What would this look like if you didn't have all of that information? How would you treat it? Uh, and does it become intimate? And it does. It actually, it, it's almost like watching somebody undress. You know, it's just, there's something happening. Should I be looking at this? Should I not be looking at this? And it's this incredibly powerful piece that, that Sage and I were able to do together. It was her first performance piece. Uh, she was very nervous, but I helped her. You got to put on that face and just move forward and do the work. And uh, she did it beautifully, beautifully. Um, I would later go on to do a version of this, and it was called Invis Invisible Eulogy. So I'm in the full outfit, and I would take up space. I have a hand drum, and I'm just hitting the hand drum and just disturbing the space. And then stop, and I do a spoken word piece, and then I would just continue with the drum and do a spoken word piece. And so I'm just taking up space with sound and body. And, you know, it's funny walking through this space that we're in, uh, like people would literally run out of the way. <laughs> like they just hear the drum. I'm not marching, I'm not running, but they would just, they would flee. <laughs> and it was just the power of sound and presence it was, it was amazing. And a year later, somebody asked uh, Sage and I to do the Invisible Loss Movement again. And of course she's a young lady. So in a year, like nothing fits her anymore. And um, so we made a piece together and we just called it Invisible. And uh, she made comment on uh, missing and murdered indigenous women, uh, girls and two-spirit, two-spirit being sort of a, uh, an indigenous way of saying LGBTQ plus. Um, and uh, the epidemic of that, she did a spoken word piece that we worked on together, and then she would read the names of victims. And I would stand in uh, the outfit, and this, this one I'm not in the full outfit, I have other ones where I'm in the full outfit. Um, and I would just lightly hit the drum, which represents oftentimes just a heartbeat. And so I would just very lightly hit the drum, enough you could hear it, not enough to disturb what she was doing. Uh, and it's incredible to watch her. She's got the red handprint on her face, which is about missing and murdered indigenous women, uh, girls and two spirits. She's wearing a red shirt denoting it. She's wearing a red ribbon shirt. Uh, and she was standing on this plinth and just making these statements as uh, boldly, only as boldly as a 15-year-old uh, can. Uh, and it's incredible and beautiful and sad. Um, that Smithsonian piece I told you about, um, I actually got to do it, the TP filled with Ikea furniture. Uh, and it was, called, uh, it was called Modern Indigenous Living. And uh, we graffitied the outside of the TP, me and a friend of mine. Uh, and then we filled the inside of the teepee with basic wares. I'm sitting on a bed. Uh, of course, this is pandemic. This was last year, so I've got the mask on. Um, but again, it's, it's presence. Can I indigenize these things? Can I indigenize my face? Can I braid my hair? Can I uh, wear a suit coat? And all of it was sort of akin to these old images from the turn of the century where you'd have a native, you know, that maybe is 
delegating to uh, Washington DC and they're wearing a suit, but they still have their hair and they still have all of the parts. And so that's sort of the nod. That's why I'm wearing a high vest, uh, which was very hard to find. And, uh, and just being in that space and then coming out of the teepee, I said, uh, you know, like so much of what you think I am is based on what you think I should be you know, am I more or less native because of this, or am I more or less native because of this? And and I took my hair and pulled it out, and I said, am I more or less native because my hair's long, and then just whoosh, cut it off. And there was just a, <gasps> like, in the crowd, and it was just this idea of, like, am I more or less native because my hair is long or because of the perception of those things? And the answer in the eyes of white folks generally speaking, is yes. Uh, you are more native if your hair is long. Um, and that's simply not true. Uh, that's whether or not my hair is long or short, the, my name has been read by, the, um, by um, the council of my tribe as being a legitimate um, member of this community. Uh, whether my children look uh, more or less white, is a result of their, um, their, it's a result of nothing, it's a result of family. They're, they are members of our tribal community, regardless of what you think. Uh, and in the face of sovereignty, or respecting the right that our tribal communities have to govern themselves, um, that that is more legitimate than what your perception is, but trying to convince Americans of that is incredibly difficult. This is a piece uh, that I just did a few weeks ago, um, and it's called uh, The Whites Are Coming, um, or Spectator Sport. And we're sitting on some bleachers, some sports bleachers, um, on what is the Santa Fe Trail, and there's a town in Colorado called Trinidad, and Trinidad uh, was celebrating the 200th anniversary of the Santa Fe Trail a trade route. Um, and in their celebration is the erasure of indigenous people and uh, where native people were in this time and place. And so I created this piece specifically as though we are a group of natives sitting on the trail watching uh, the white people come. And we would stand there in silence. And there was a lot of people there. It was very funny. And then all of a sudden we'd start jeering and booing, go home. And I think I screamed. No, I did scream. Uh, why are you so red? Like they're sunburnt, you know, they've been <laughs> and just uh, this idea of like, and, and what was really important is, is like some people are wearing regalia and some people are wearing t-shirts and some people are, their hair is long and some people their hair is not. And, uh, and then I was able to also do this piece, um, which I'm dressed in. Uh, his name is Pudusu, which means in a while, and Pudusu has a spoken word piece where he talks about the future. Where he says uh, that the existence or your ability to connect with your, uh, with your forebears is not predicated upon you bathing in the trauma of your people, that you can connect with them without that. Um, and it kind of goes on from there, but it's a, a, like he's a future character that has come to specifically tell everybody that just keep on, everything's going to be okay. Uh, his name is Pudusu, which is a, a Paiute word. It means in a while. And I'm uh, doing a lot of things. So right now I'm also working on this, and I think this is where I'm ending. Uh, if I remember right, and um, I'm creating signs as a street art uh, campaign that will be all along Colorado with the hopes of expanding it to, um, to uh, the entire continental U.S. Uh, that is, looks like legitimate signs. These will be aluminum signs that I will hang and where signs are hung and uh, where it challenges these perceptions. The hope is to um, actually have a phone number on here so I can document people calling in with their anger or whatever. And, uh, and then also um, to eventually get to a place where I can do like, his, like sarcastic historical markers and uh, things like that. Again, disrupting spaces um, and trying to have some, some fun with it. But also, I mean, this is real, you know, like people realizing that they are on native land. Um, that's a real struggle, and I think it's incredibly important. Um, and this is, I think, a, an easily accessible way to do it. Um, 
although I might have some more uh, <laughs> signs that have a little more a little more punch to them. But um, but even still, I mean, these are important conversations. You know, I once had somebody tell me, uh, you know, you are um, like when I was doing the mascot debate. Um, they were like, well, you're just talking about this because it's relevant and it gives you a little bit of leg up, you know, as an artist to do whatever it is you want to do, it gives you some notoriety. Without realizing that everything that I do and everything we talk about um, has to do with life. When I was doing in the middle of the mascot debate, um, I was at home having to coach my children to not talk about the mascot debate even though it's part of the vernacular of our home, like don't take this to school, don't have an argument with somebody about this um, because a peer might give you a hard time, but really my greatest fear was that uh, an educator might decide that their uh, being a fan is more important than them being an educator and could bully my child, that's a real thing. And so uh, while that mascot debate was happening, we were dealing with the very real ramifications of being native uh, in an area that's not very kind to natives, uh, not very appropriate to native people. And so all of these things are mirroring my own life and things that I see and that I'm uh, traversing every day. And uh, I think that that's art. I mean, the voice is my, uh, my life's work. Um, the work is my life's work. Um, but the voice is also life, you know? And uh, I don't know that, it, you hear it all the time, but you know, art imitating life, but, um, but it is life. And so that plays a big part in everything that I do and honestly and truly wouldn't trade it for anything. So that's it. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and open up the Q and A session of these presentation, and I, I, I do have one quick question for you, Greg. Uh, the Invisible Loss piece versus uh, a normal Native American dance demonstration, uh, do you, did you notice a big shift in the way people treated it? Because one, normally you have an MC describing what they're doing sure. versus uh, the silence. Um, did, were people more uh, respect, uh, was, did they respect the piece more versus one or the other? Was there more attention uh, put onto the piece? Did you notice any big shift in that? I think, um, I think generally speaking, when people come into contact with something that they don't understand or that they're not sure about that they can and, and oftentimes will overcompensate, um, that was certainly the case with this. So uh, they were like, well, what, is th what does this beadwork mean? And what does this ribbon mean? And it's just like, nothing like we're just you're making something that's pretty something that looks nice um one woman said she's like i noticed that when you were dancing that there was this moment that uh you added an extra step and what does that extra step mean and i said the extra step means that i have bad rhythm and <laughs> i mean that's it so um it, w it was really frustrating because instead of talking about the the piece as a viable piece of performance art they instead were stuck on the idea that every movement, every stitch, every bead was somehow sacred. That sort of fetishizing of indigenous spirituality instead of allowing things just to be what they are. Um, all of which of course comes from popular media sort of informing uh, you know, the, magical, the magical Indian uh, trope. Um, I didn't really see too much difference. I mean, most people go to powwows, they're, they're going because they're curious or because they want to support or whatever. And uh, I don't think anybody was mean hearted, but it's certainly frustrating in terms of even just the, the type of vernacular that's being used and like how you approach it. Like everything's not necessarily sacred. Sometimes it just is like that step is not sacred. I just couldn't keep the beat and that's it. <laughs> it's, it's some, and people are really let down by that, so. <laughs> Real quick reminder for the Stetson students that are joining online, please look in the chat box for uh, the link to your survey. Also, uh, if you have a question, please approach a mic inside in here if anybody else has a question. No? Oh. So, hi. <laughs> 
I wondered if you could speak about, the, you said that um, one performance piece with the four antagonists got out of hand. Mm. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, first, I had to talk all of them into doing it. Um, one of them is actually a, a, like a critical race theory professor at Georgetown. And he was like, yeah, I don't really want to do it, but I think it'd be a good exercise and like talk to my students about it. And um, yeah, so I had to talk them into it. I gave them the information, but I didn't give them much, anything more than that. And so they just kind of had to figure it out. And I could tell when we first started that they were like, you know, poking me with a stick sort of, you know, <laughs> just like saying a little something here, saying a little something there. But then somebody said something bold and then it just snowballed. And so it's sort of uh, almost like a, um, uh, like a mob mentality where it just escalated. And they didn't do anything wrong. They did exactly what I wanted them to do. But it was really interesting how quickly it got away from them. Because I could tell they were very controlled in the beginning. And then that control started, they started to lose their grip. Um, but they weren't in a place or a position where they could hurt me. Uh, but I, I'm, I don't know if I told this story before, but um, you know, when it was done, uh, it was part of a, an event called Art All Night in DC. It happens every year. And uh, so we did it all night and then uh, packed up and I went home. By the time I get home, the kids are getting up, we're watching cartoons and um, just chilling with the kids and sort of decompressing. And like, it's all good. Like, I'm just chilling, we're watching Mulan or whatever. And, and uh, our, uh, we were sitting there and I started getting text messages from those four antagonizers. And they were like, hey, is everything okay? Like, I'm really sorry. I don't know what I said. I didn't do this. And then one of them called me and he was, he was literally just weeping. He's like, I feel awful. I'm so sorry that I did this. And, and then just realizing that, that I didn't equip them, which is my bad. Uh, you know, like they were ill-equipped to deal with everything that happened. But likewise, that I'm fully equipped to deal with what happened, which doesn't have anything to do with me being an artist, but has to do with me being a native person that has heard things his whole life and, um, and just how to cycle through that and how to move on. And it was a really interesting exercise in that way um, because they did get out of hand, but that's how it was supposed to happen. But I think they were just, it got so out of hand that they were concerned that they had crossed the line. And that's why they were calling and they were upset. They felt guilty and they just felt ashamed. They, they, these are all words they used, um, which is uh, fascinating to me. I wish there was a way I could have documented that aspect of it. Hello. Uh, how do you find sustainability and rest? through a very intensive line of work like this? Um, well, I don't do it every day, so there's that. Uh, no, I think uh, it's the reason why I introduced my family at the beginning. That, that's how uh, sustainability happens through that. Um, there's been some things that I've done that was incredibly difficult. The um, Indian pedigree, the tattoo piece, um, I had some people tape that and take pictures of it. Um, after it was done, I didn't touch it for two years. Like I didn't look at the footage. I didn't want to see it because I know because I get emotional during it and like I just kind of start breaking down a little bit and I just didn't want to have to deal with that. Um, so time and mostly my family. I, t I do my best to take time away from what I'm doing to concentrate on other things, whether that's you know, playing video games or cooking dinner or whatever. So there's there's a lot of breakup of the monotony. I'm not I'm not living in my head nearly as much as you know you think I might be. If that makes sense. Um, and I, and if I can justify it, like the last American Indian on Earth was actually really really difficult. The first time I did that, um, I was scared to death I was going to run into another native, and then I was going to have to explain like how messed up this thing is. Um, and that happened. Uh, it was pretty funny. And I'm like, okay, listen, I'm sorry. Okay, here's the deal. <laughs> like, um, but uh, it was, I was afraid. I knew it would work uh, because I worked at the National Museum of American Indians when it opened and from September 2004 when it opened to 
April 2005, a million people had been through those doors, and we had been, I was part of a group that dealt with the public, and people are awful. They are just so, so awful, and that's how I knew the last American Indian on Earth would work. Um, but I was also really afraid, and so that first time I did it was really hard, and then the second time I did it, um, I went to my wife, and I was like, I don't think I can keep doing this. Like, this is really, really difficult, and... Uh, the things people say, the things people do, the way I feel just in general, sort of embodying this thing and wearing this stupid headdress that like barely fits on my head. And, um, but then the Huffington Post came out uh, about it. So we did that in June. So by September, I think it was, uh, Huffington Post wrote a piece about it. And then I started getting emails uh, from young natives talking about their experiences. And the, they would first say like, thank you for making this and then they would share something very intimate. And I remember having that conversation with my wife where I was just like, I didn't expect this part of it. And she's like, well, you know what you have to do. And I was like, yeah, like that means I need to be approachable in my work. It means that I need to do my very best at being humble. I'm not the humblest guy, so I gotta work that out. And then you have to carry these stories. You gotta answer every email that comes and you have to carry those stories. Um, that made it worthwhile for me to do it for the next year because I realized that there's, that I'm sharing my own personal ideas, my own personal experience. I'm speaking with my voice. I'm not speaking with a collective native voice. I'm speaking from my voice. But my experience can speak to a shared experience. And so if I create something and it goes out and then uh, there's people that that are, are moved by it and they take that upon themselves, they, they add that to their list of things that you know articulate their identity or whatever. Um, I accept that as part of the work, it's not my goal, but that I accept that as part of the work. Um, but it does, in that case, with the last American Indian on Earth, makes it easier to know that this is not just happening, but it ends up kind of happening for a reason. And, um, and all the work sort of lives in that space, I think. Um, there's an element of sacrifice, I think, in just about every performance piece I've ever done. Um, whether that's drawing blood from your arm, from a tattoo, to you know, putting yourself in danger, you know, social danger or physical danger, whatever that is. Um, but it always comes back to the family for me. It always does. So I'm lucky to have them because I know a lot of people don't necessarily have that, and that's tough. Have you? Uh ever thought at what point the sacrifice level is for you? Like, what's a cutoff point? I don't know. It was when I did The Last American Indian on Earth, I was hoping somebody would punch me in the face because um, I thought that looked great on camera. Uh, it would be a great photograph, like somebody. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've, I've literally bled in some of my paintings before um, and included in my list of materials. Um, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I haven't found anything that speaks beyond. Um, I mean, geez, I went to a Redskins tailgating party once, like, to interview people as a Native person with long hair, you know, and that was, that was not super pleasant, but, um, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure. I'm not sure yet. I haven't gotten there yet. Maybe I won't, but <laughs> who knows? Hey, Greg. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about the paintings you were doing before you started making paintings about your, your Native American experience and what kind of content you were playing with. Bef because I know we, we talked about how you changed and you, your paintings um, uh, moved towards the same subject and content as your performance art and how they yeah. were separate for a long time. So I'd, I'd love if you could talk about that. Yeah, um, I think that everything has like multiple lives. <laughs> so uh, this was the work that I was doing. Um, the conversation that, that we had uh, was about, um, let's see, an art critic uh, in Indian country made a comment saying that like contemporary native art 
does not look like old men in headdresses. And then they didn't name any names, but they described work that <laughs> my work was definitely in that realm. Um, and then there's a deliberate reason why I was doing work like this. Um, and I had plans to move past it. Um, but I was making work that was, I think, easily accessible, but that accessibility was also sort of based on um, creating something that wasn't just accessible in terms of getting images and being able to use those images, but accessible to people on the outside, that they're looking at something, they understand what they're looking at, um, that these old images are like sort of within the American lexicon, uh, uh, an understanding of, of native existence. Um, this was sort of the, where I was at with work. Um, I think this one might fall in line with that as well because it's the source image is one of those old images. Um, and the trends of this, uh, of work that becomes popularized in uh, Indian country is like the, at the time that this was, before it became popular, it was like me and one other artist who's a good friend of mine, we were doing work like this. Um, it, they were different, but using similar images. And, um, and then as that was becoming popular, so too like did all these other native artists start doing the same thing. And so I think that's where the comment was, but then also realizing that like as an artist, I need to challenge myself and sort of move beyond what I'm working on at the moment and move somewhere else that continues to challenge me. Um, and so I know that, you know, like the punk, this uh, punk rock series, like I know I'm not gonna be doing this forever. You know, I know it's gonna go away. And, um, but working kind of within the realm of things like this and things like this, like these are new places. And um, trying to figure out how else to create more of that. Like this, this exists within that space too. Um, illustrating this image so that I'm no longer using the photograph was sort of part of that as well. Stepping away from the original source image and trying to step into a place of of um, like creation, I created this. Um, and I think like this was probably part, like a piece is part of that transition uh, where it's like I'm using that old image but I've changed the image by putting a ski mask on them. And uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, when I very first started, uh, like I was pretty disenfranchised like as a native person and um, and I was like, I don't want to be a native artist. I just want to be an artist. And uh, so I just made the work that I wanted to make. And then this native narrative started creeping back up into it. But it was also just this, like taking that disenfranchisement and breaking it down and rebuilding it back up. And one of the most important tools of that for me was stepping away from asking permission to do anything and just doing it. And maybe preparing an apology if I need to, but like for the most part, speaking and speaking true to my own voice. That was a big, a big thing. And, um, and then getting to this place of like using this work and transitioning to something that was more real for me uh, was very much about challenging the perception of what I think people want to see and pushing more towards things that are in that badass situation of questioning, you know, what people think that they see or what they think they want to see for what's actually real because, you know, this work is real. That's really real. And um, this is way harder to look at than that or even that. It all It's all relevant, but I also think it's part of us growing as artists is trying to find those challenges, overcome those challenges, and continue to challenge yourself. And if you don't challenge yourself, then you can't grow. And if you can't grow, well, then you're just, you got, you're a one trick pony. And I don't wanna be a one trick pony. I just, I wanna make work that continues to speak to truth as I evolve and understand what that truth is, however that truth is. And to also do it unapologetically, to like create with reckless abandon. And that is just, that has to be, where I'm at, that has to be what I'm doing. So when this article comes out and says, you know, are you, uh, or that uh, this work is not what you think it is, um, and I have sort of an existential crisis, I have to have that existential crisis. That's part of it. You have to have those crises. Crises? Crisis, yeah. And 
Um, but I'm also surrounded by people that help me and support me. So when I talked to my wife about it and she said, uh, you know, your performance work is really badass. Why doesn't your paintings look like your performance work? And that's a true statement. She's right. And then I talked to like one of my best friends and I told him the same thing. And you know what he said to me? You know, your performance art is really badass. Why don't your paintings look like your performance art? And so by the mouth of two or three witnesses, right? So <laughs> I just, I'm like, you're right. You're right. Like, that's not an insult to me. That's like, that is an observation that is true. And I trust these people and they can say that to me and I can take that without being hurt. Being like, okay, crisis over. What's the next step? Like, we need to move on from this. And um, so it's a constant push. It's a constant, constant push. But I think I answered your question. That's <laughs> I guess that's it. Uh, thank you very much, Greg. Thank you. Uh, <laughs>